A loved one taken without warning. It sort of tips your world upside down. A tragic accident or a brutal, calculated murder. Why would somebody want to do that? And then suspicion started to mount. A desperate need to secure vital clues. We don't exactly know what's occurred. Without that, we're losing valuable evidence and we're losing time. A fairy tale marriage. That was to be tragically cut short. In the foothills of the beautiful Derbyshire Peak District, the market town of Chesterfield is a busy commercial hub, famous for the twisted spire on its parish church. Chesterfield is, is your average town. We live in a predominantly rural county. Uh, it's got your normal crime level and incidents as you would expect. Over the years there has been serious violence and things like that, but it is very rare to Chesterfield. The town was home to Colette and Christopher Daffin, who grew up, met and married here in 1993. As a family, it was uh, happy to be together, happy in life, happy just, just as a normal family. But in July 2009, their happy family life was to be shattered forever. Colette Daffin was born in 1965 and grew up with her mum, Maddie, and dad, John, along with her brother, Chris, and sister, Jane, in the Claycross district of Chesterfield. She was the one that had the cuts and bruises. She ought to have been a boy. She used to crack jokes, and I think that come from her dad, though. Colette was uh, like any normal child, uh, ever so fun-loving. When we had Chris and Jane, she was always the one to take them, take them under a wing sort of thing. She was an uh, absolutely ideal daughter. Uh, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't wish for one better. In time, Colette's parents separated and she went to live with her mum and her mum's new partner on private drive in the Chesterfield suburb of Hollingwood. In her teenage years, Colette met a boy and became pregnant. The relationship did not last and Colette was left to bring up her newborn son, Richard, alone. We looked after her, just up to it. Colette was uh, a, r a real natural mother. She was so loving, as mothers are. I think she had the same difficulties as, uh, uh, as most single mums. Uh, money were a little bit tight, but she did go to work. Colette got a job serving behind the bar at the local pub, the Hollingwood, and it was on a night working here that Colette met Christopher Daffin. The couple got on from their first meeting and soon became a serious item. When Colette met Chris, um, she, seemed, she seemed happy. So if she's happy, I'm happy. I've seen her drink every day. <laughs> I thought Chris was a fine lad from the day we met. Uh, we never had a bad word. I'd never had really a bad thing about him. He's uh, a guy that uh, you'd like your daughter to meet. And the couple became closer still when Colette gave birth to their son, Jason. Shortly afterwards, Christopher and Colette announced they were getting married. When she came and told me that she was getting married, I just went, well, be, you know. <laughs> seemed very happy together. I mean, they got married in a, a Methodist church at Staveley. And, you know, they were all happy and that, smiling. And so, I mean, as far as I was concerned, it was a good day. Colette was absolutely radiant on a wedding day. She was uh, so happy. Life had taken off, I think. Uh, you know, everything was... Uh, every, everything, I suppose, a young girl dreams of was uh, that... Uh, it, it was happening. She just looked so beautiful and she looked so happy. I think to Colette it was the happiest day of her life. She did look really happy. <laughs> Love and cherish. Love and cherish. Till death was do not. But on that magical day, 
no one could have anticipated that an early death would tragically end this beautiful marriage. What's taking place now, you would never, ever, ever dream that uh, that, that, was, that, that would ever happen. 16 years after the couple's perfect wedding day, what appeared to be a routine road traffic collision turned out to be far more sinister. Christopher and Colette Daffin married in the town of Chesterfield in 1993. After 16 years of marriage, Colette was 43 years old. Christopher was 42. With their two children, Richard, 24, and Jason, 16, they were the picture of the regular family living on an average street. Chris was an electrician, and Colette worked alongside her mum at a local hotel. They wanted somebody um, as a some a waitress like and I approached Claire and said do you want to come wake up and be with me you know on my breakfast shift so she says oh that'd be nice mum I says well just go up for an interview I says I'm sure you'll get a job and she did so we were all happy together you know it was a good environment to work we all got on well when their eldest son Richard moved to Cumbria for work Colette, Chris, and youngest son Jason moved to a new house on Cedar Street. When she moved to Cedar Street, um, she only lived uh, just at Ops, getting a jump away from where, where I live. So we both found it easy to get to work because it was only a walk. In fact, Colette's short walk to work would pass the very pub where she and Chris first met many years before. Early in the morning on the 8th of July, 2009, Chris and Colette Daffin woke to an empty house. Their son, Richard, had moved to Cumbria for work, and their second son, Jason, was on holiday with family friends. Like most other mornings, they sat down to have breakfast together before going their separate ways for work. However, this morning, Chris decided that he was not going to go straight to work. You don't mind if we're fishing here, isn't Instead, he was going to go fishing at the local canal, just a couple of hundred yards from their home. With Chris gone, Colette got herself ready and left for work as a breakfast waitress around the usual time of 5.45 a.m. Her usual route to work was down Cedar Street, along Pine Street and continuing down Elm Street to the Ringwood Hall Hotel. Around this time, dog walkers noticed a man behaving strangely on private drive. Witnesses at that time, um, a couple of dog walkers had come forward and been identified who walk the dogs same time every day. And they'd identified something really unusual, which was a man hiding in the bushes near the Hollywood pub wearing a grey hooded jacket and possibly sunglasses and they'd never seen this man before, and it was unusual for somebody who appeared to be quite furtive, walking away and then going back to the bushes. So his old demeanour was quite uh, suspicious. As she approached Pine Street, Colette received a phone call. Possibly as a reaction to this call, or distracted by it, Colette didn't turn down Pine Street as usual, but headed towards Private Drive, a slightly longer route to work. I used to go to work a bit before Colette, because um, with me being supervisor, I'd got a bit first there. So she used to poll in probably about 10, 15 minutes later. She was always happy go lucky when she come in. Um, she was a bright breakfast up. However, Maddie wasn't at work that day on the 8th of July, as she had booked a day's leave. Colette Daffin never arrived at work that morning either. Well, as I arrived at work on the, on the 8th of July, um, the first thing I was notified was that there had been a, a fatal RTC, a non-stop road traffic collision where the vehicle had collided with the pedestrian and driven off. So it's still a suspicious incident, something we treat very seriously. When Chris Daffin arrived home at about 6.30 that morning, 
he received a call from one of Colette's colleagues asking him where Colette was, as she had not turned up for work. All right. Well, she left at the normal time. Christopher made a call to the, to the police and the phone call to us was very much, my wife's not turned up for work. The police told Chris there had been an accident on private drive, which Superintendent Debbie Platt was monitoring. What we'd do is uh, road policing would take lead for the investigation supported by a detective inspector. And we would lock down uh, the road. Um, we would try and identify the deceased, obviously. The fact that Hollingwood was such a close-knit community meant officers at the scene were quickly able to put a name to the deceased. There was a witness who came forward very, very close by to, to the actual reporting of the incident, who basically says, I know that person, I know who it is. The body was identified as 42-year-old mother of two, Colette Daffin. You've then got the distressing uh, part of, of this job, which is having to speak to the family face to face. And I was sat at the kitchen, I was sat at my dressing gown, having a cup of tea, and there's not come to the door. I could see a policeman and the policewoman. And they told me that there'd been an accident. I said, where is she? He said, I'm private dress. No, we can't be just for that. Claire, don't go that way. I can't remember anything from there. <laughs> An officer was also dispatched to inform Christopher Daffin that his wife of 16 years was dead. Hi, Chris Daffin? Yeah. Uh, can I come in a bit, please? Yeah. The initial family liaison officer, he, he went to Christopher's address. He wasn't too sure about Chris's reaction. For all intents and purposes, his wife's left to go to work and she's been involved in this collision and there was just something that just didn't seem to be right. Uh, it didn't show that much emotion. I appreciate that people deal with grief very differently and he'd had the most distressing news he could possibly take, but his responses and lack of engagement um, were a worry. On hearing the news of Colette's death, Chris went to call on his mother-in-law, Maddie, as news of the accident spread to other members of Colette's family. Around about nine o'clock, I was informed by my manager that what had happened, and he, he, he uh, actually brought me home, and somebody else brought my car. And then I walked in the house, and I don't think for one minute there was anybody in the house. They all seemed to be outside on the patio. And I walked out to See, Maddie were in a. She was devastated, and at the time, her and Chris were sort of putting their arms around each other, consoling each other. I didn't know what to do myself. I was sort of. I don't know how to put it really. I, I thought, what can you do now? I mean, and I ended up having to phone everybody up. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. This is. There's been an accident. I says, yeah. He says, it's, says, it's your clit. Yeah. I says, right, I'll be, I'll be over as soon as I can when I've just, you know, I've spun car back round him. And he said, no, it's fatal. So, the uh, only thing I, I, I thought to do was ring my dad up. I just says, how are you, Chris? Everything all right? And he says, uh, no. And uh, that's when the news came out. But it, uh, it sort of tips your world upside down. It screamed. I, could, I can hear that scream now. When he told me Colette had lost her life. Yeah, that's, uh, that's not good. When I found out that it was a hit and run, I thought Chris would be absolutely fuming. 
absolutely fuming. Because well, he's losing his wife that morning, you know, a few hours ago. We find out it's it's him run. It's still clear in my mind now, as it was over a year ago, and it won't go away. But something I'll have to learn to live with. Detective Inspector Rick Alton was starting to piece together the events surrounding Colette's death. The main thing that I needed to look at is setting off inquiries to actually try and locate the actual vehicle that had, caused, that had been involved in the collision. Again, a member of the local community was able to assist the police. He was travelling about 80 yards behind the offending vehicle when Colette was mowed down. The make of the vehicle is Vauxhall Frontier, and it was like the maroon, burgundy maroon uh, red. We were quite fortunate to have a witness account that basically followed the Frontier down the road. As the vehicle was travelling down, it took an aggressive action towards the pavement which, again, building that in against the camber of the road would suggest to me that we was going to change this from not an average hit-and-run accident where somebody had been involved in a collision and then gone out of sheer shock. It was quite obvious that this was going to change to a murder investigation. Investigations at the scene were also revealing evidence that was to become significant in the inquiry. In the bottom of the hedgerow was part of the registration number L5 and trying to match that with the Vauxhall Frontier. Uh, and that gave us quite a, a significant lead in relation to tracing the vehicle. The police national computer came up with 66 red-coloured Vauxhall Frontier vehicles with a registration starting with L5 in the Greater Chesterfield area. An intelligence officer would obviously identify all of the 66 vehicles, identify the addresses, and then there would be actions to different officers or to different force areas to find out what movements that vehicle's taken. One of the leads detectives followed was that six months earlier, a Vauxhall Frontier, matching the exact description of the vehicle that killed Colette, had been repeatedly reported as abandoned around the Clock Tower Business Centre in Chesterfield. I was made aware that um, from the intelligence officer that um, a red frontier had been seen at the clockhouse tower, which isn't too far away from the scene. Uh, and that was a, an abandoned vehicle report where um, a number of different people have rung in to say this vehicle's parked on private land, um, but clearly has got no MOT uh, or tax and was causing an obstruction. But on the day of Colette's death, searches for the Frontier in and around the Clock Tower Business Centre proved fruitless. With police believing this was now a murder inquiry, a specialist family liaison officer from Derbyshire CID was appointed to the Daffin family. I was asked to note anything that I thought was suspicious. The time I spent with Christopher, my gut reaction was that something was not right. Uh, the behaviours he displayed, things he did, didn't seem to me to be um, the behaviours or the actions of a man who had just found out his wife had been killed. I just remember him being distracted and looking back quite cold on that morning. Back at the scene of the crime, further evidence was being uncovered. Colette has obviously come to rest uh, once the vehicle's taken off at approximately where we are now, but the critical points for us as the investigating officer and me myself is the fact that in her, in her left hand she had a mobile phone which had obviously suffered during the impact from the frontier and it was broken in several pieces. The alarm bells start to ring, who's she been in contact with or who's tried to contact her? So for me to obtain that phone data would give me a line of inquiry to actually find out who she's been talking to and, and the length and time of the calls as well, which starts the investigation going and gives it some focus. Police were about to obtain information from Colette's crushed mobile phone that could quite possibly tear Colette's family apart.
the market town of Chesterfield, lying in the foothills of the Derbyshire Dales, was home to Colette and Christopher Daffin, who married in the town in 1993. On the morning of the 8th of July, 2009, Colette made her usual walk to work at the nearby Ringwood Hall Hotel. But Colette's journey was cut short at around 6 a.m. that morning, when she was callously run down by a red-coloured 4x4 that failed to stop. Investigations at the scene led police to believe that this was not a road traffic accident, but a murder. And the fact Colette was on the phone around the time of her death led the police to request her phone data. The mobile phone became very significant in itself because when we'd done some call data, it became then evident that um, there had been two calls from Christopher Daffins to Colette Daffin, mobile to mobile, and Colette Daffin back to Christopher Daffin. And these calls were between half past five in the morning and six o'clock. And we believe she was killed around six o'clock that morning. So those four phone calls and that contact between them is very significant. And it was more significant because Christopher Daffin never told us about any of this. However, Christopher Daffin did tell police that, as part of his electrical business, he rented storage space at the Clock Tower Business Centre, the same centre where a red Frontera had been spotted abandoned in the months leading up to Colette's death. Information uh, came in that um, Christopher Daffin had got a lock-up uh, in the Clockhouse Tower. That then became quite critical information for me and Christopher Daffin's status as a suspect was massively raised. Senior Officer Debbie Platt called Family Liaison Officer Nicola Clark and Detective Constable Dave Portis to the scene where they were briefed on the latest developments by Detective Inspector Rick Alton. One of the inquiries that I wanted Dave to do when he went to support Nicky is to obviously find Christopher Twofold, one, to get him away from the family, because I knew which way I think this investigation is now starting to go. And secondly, to obtain his phone. About 20 minutes past one on that afternoon, we arrived at um, Maddie's house, Colette's mum's. Well, Christopher left. He'd left the house, and he told them he was going to walk the family dog, and he'd gone home. So uh, our next move, obviously, was to go to Five Cedar Street, the marital home of Christopher and Colette Daffin. Hi, Chris. I'm DC Dave Porters. Uh, can we come in and talk to you? I asked him questions about his movements that morning, and I told him that we wanted his telephone. Uh, the only real um, questions he asked back were, why I wanted the telephone, there were no other questions really. And I just explained to him that everything had to be looked into. It was a very serious incident and we needed to look at his phone. I stepped outside the premises and left Nicky with Christopher Daffin and I telephoned Rick Alton, the DI. I explained to him I got the telephone, the mobile phone. I also told him that this, this, something didn't seem right. He was uh, too calm, there were no, he wasn't cut up at all about what had happened. Something wasn't right, something just wasn't right. Chris, uh, I want you to accompany us to the, uh, to the police station. It made a decision to bring Christopher Daffin back to Chesterfield Division Headquarters mm -hmm. to get details of what had happened to him that morning, what his movements were and where he'd been, and what he knew about Colette's movements. He agreed to this, and, and we set off and we came back to Chesterfield Police Station. There was concern around uh, how he was behaving with the uh, family liaison officers. There was concern around the vehicle was still outstanding. We still hadn't identified the Red Frontier. We knew that um, Christopher Daffin had got a lock up at the clock tower. We could put an abandoned Red Frontier, a similar number plate, to the clock house tower. And we knew that we weren't dealing with a non stop collision at that point. If a woman dies in this country, the vast percentage die at the hands of a partner or husband. But if this was to prove to be a domestic murder, it was not following the usual pattern of events associated with this type of crime. The issue with domestic homicide, there generally appears to be an escalation of risk before 
somebody would have called, whether it was a neighbour, whether it was the victim, to report domestic abuse. The unusual factor in this case is that um, there was no history of domestic abuse reported to the police. On the contrary, descriptions of Colette and Christaffin given to the police were of a very happily married couple. And that, for me, was quite an unusual factor if we were considering him a suspect. Part of me would have anticipated that there would be something there, a motive or something uh, around previous domestic violence within that household, and there didn't appear to be anything. With no previous knowledge of Christopher Daffin, it was vital that police build a picture of who he was and more precisely an account of his movements that morning. Christopher Daffin told me that himself and Colette had slept together that night. They got up in the morning at five o'clock. He'd left the house at quarter past five and he was gonna go fishing. So he went to the, uh, the canal, which is local, only a few hundred yards from where they live, really. He said that there'd been telephone calls and, and texts between him, himself and Colette whilst he was at the canal. Something about a, an errand, she wanted him to run for bread. And, and that's as much as he said, really. And then following that, he'd got back home and received a telephone call from Colette's boss at work and telling him that she'd not arrived for work. So Christopher said he rang the police he was told uh, that there had been an accident and somebody would come and see him. He also said that he walked from his house at Cedar Street to the scene, or to the, where the scene was taped off from, uh, where he was met by a police or uniformed police officer. He explained who he was to the officer, and the officer took him home. Very shortly after that, I believe, um, the message was passed by officers that Colette was involved in the accident. Dave phoned me once he got down to the police station and basically gave me just a brief account of what Christopher was initially saying and there was no sign of him going fishing. Nobody had seen any fishing tackle and if he was fishing when that had, you know, when he had the news, it was a very short fishing trip. I'm local to this area. I know Chesterfield very well. I do a lot of mountain biking and I do do that route sometimes down there along the canal at Hollywood. Uh, and I know uh, where he's saying he was fishing that there isn't a signal down there. It just increases my suspicions around whether his account is actually true or not. With D.I. Alton convinced Chris was lying about where he was at the time of the phone call to Colette, the police decided to take a dramatic step in the investigation. About two o'clock in the afternoon, possibly a bit later, um, myself, uh, D.I. Alton, who's the deputy SIO, uh, we sat in a police van and we were just reviewing the evidence and the picture was obviously building uh, around Christopher Daffin. And obviously to arrest anybody is a serious step and not one that you would ever take lightly. You run through a whole series of um, questions in your mind because um, the impact for this family if I arrest an innocent man would possibly be catastrophic because not only have we told this family that the mother's died that their daughter's died but we're now also going to have to go back and inform them that the man we've arrested is the dad is their son-in-law is their son and that's a, a really difficult decision to make but the evidence was stacking up overwhelmingly against Christopher and it's my duty to account for Colette's death. And that's when it's the decision, yeah, arresting for the murder. And although, and, and you say it now, it's quite easy to say, but within that van, there was quite a lot of pressure. Because as soon as we make that decision, not only is it gonna focus our investigation in relation to Christopher, what we have to bear in mind as well is that it's going to tear that family, potentially tear that family apart. We hadn't located the vehicle. Christopher Daffin wasn't wearing a grey hooded top uh, at the house, so there were obviously key pieces of evidence missing. But my view was that um, there was too much suspicion not to arrest, and uh, we needed then to secure the house, the vehicle, um, he'd got a couple of vehicles on his drive anyway, um, and that for me became a key line of inquiry. The decision to arrest Christopher Daffin only seven hours after the death of his wife Colette 
was even a surprise to the investigating officers taking Chris's statement in Chesterfield Police Station. As I was taking the statement, we got approximately a page and a half through the statement, and I received a phone call from the I. Alton again. So I obviously left the room. I'm speaking to Dave Porter over the phone and basically instructed him that this is what we want to do. Christopher's bit to be arrested on suspicion of the murder of his wife. And there was a bit of a, a pause. But then the pause went on a bit longer. And I basically had to say to Dave, did you hear that? And it come back and it was quite obvious that Dave was shocked. I was taken somewhat by surprise, uh, but I went in, uh, when I got some details off of Rick in relation to the phone calls, uh, not tallying with what he was telling us, and other information that had come to light from witnesses, I went into the same room and I arrested him on suspicion of the murder of Colette. What? You do not have to say anything? The only thing he says it was something like, uh, what? Uh, and that, that, that was the only emotion I saw from him. He never said another word. He never, he never spoke another word. If I told him to follow me down to the custody suite, and he, which he did. I led him down there. He never asked a question. He never said a word. Following the arrest of Christopher Daffin, it was Nicola Clark's job to tell Colette's family that Chris was being held in custody as a suspect in her murder. As a police officer having to turn up at the family home and inform the immediate family members that we, as the police, had now arrested a husband who they trusted um, with the care of their daughter. It was a difficult thing to have to do and their initial reactions were that they didn't want to believe. Maddie was very, uh, uh, found it very hard to believe at that time that uh, he could possibly do something like that. And she didn't want to believe it. But uh, I don't know, it's, neither of us wanted to believe it. I read on the news that they arrested a 42-year-old man on suspicion of Colette's death. Never in a million years did I think it was Chris that night. I knew they'd got the wrong man. I mean, uh, why, would, why, why would they arrest Chris? So, of course, I thought, well, he'll be released very shortly. Then we'll have a chat. With Chris Daffin now in custody, police could secure his and Colette's property and search it thoroughly for evidence to link him to the crime. They were also keen to establish a motive. The home address was sealed as a scene. There was um, two vehicles on the driveway, one of which was a, a white Vivaro van. Again, that was sealed as a scene. And we also uh, locked down uh, the lockup that Christopher used at the Clockhouse Tower and then set the parameters of what I was uh, asking staff to specifically look for. Uh, and certainly from the home address search, I was looking for a motive. Is this a domestic dispute that's, that's gone totally, totally wrong? Uh, and it's been done out of sheer frustration, pressure? Is it financial? Is there anybody else still out there that could be involved? Bear in mind with somebody lurking in the bushes. Searches within the house retrieved financial documents which police hoped might point to a possible motive, while officers beginning a search of Chris Daffin's work van we're about to make a significant discovery. Myself and two other officers we got to see the street. Uh, our intention of being, being to search a Vauxhall van, which he used for his work as an electrician. And as we removed items from the car and van, they were to be photographed. I receive a call from the search team that's responsible for the search of Christopher's van. And with what they told me, it did blow my mind to a certain extent. They've recovered items of clothing which match the description of the man that was alleged to have been in the hedgerow near to the scene. And also underneath that, a V5 document which related to a Vauxhall Frontier with the registration which started with L5. So quite hard to believe at that time. And I think after I'd put the phone down from the search advisor, it was very much sit back and have I just listened and heard what he's 
told me. The V5 logbook directly linked Chris Daffin to a vehicle that matched the description of the one that brutally mowed down his wife. And the clothes found in his work van were identical to those worn by the man seen acting suspiciously at the scene immediately before the murder. The fact that we found the old doll with the V5 document and the clothing did feel like a vindication for making the arrest, but you never make a, such an arrest on a wing and a prayer. You've got to have the courage of your convictions in this type of investigation, but we still needed to find that frontier. It's got to be somewhere local, uh, and that would be the critical piece of the jigsaw. And the person the police thought could help locate the Frontera was about to be interviewed by Detective Constables Dave Portis and Mandy Shunburn at Chesterfield Police Station. It was after 10 o'clock that night we began the first interview with Christopher Daffy. He wants to know about his family life, but by this time he'd taken advice from his solicitor and he maintained a no-comment interview. Every question that was asked, he replied, no comment. If you're genuinely an innocent individual, you would be crying out to be heard in that police station and you would be given as your movements and alibis and people who could assist and we just got no comment after no comment after no comment. No comment. And although, you know, that's a person's perfect entitlement to do that, um, I just also think it's uh, an indication of guilt of an individual. When somebody decides to go no comment, although the interviewing officers are very frustrated, I'm frustrated because the family are asking us questions around what's happening and we can't give them an account. Time was running out and the police required cast iron evidence to charge Chris Daffin with the murder of his wife. They needed to find the murder weapon, the red 4x4. And that breakthrough would come the following day. On the morning of the 9th of July, 2009, Colette Daffin's husband, Christopher, was in custody in Chesterfield. He was being held on suspicion of her murder by running her down in a red 4x4 the previous day. Colette's family found it impossible to believe her husband had killed her. We thought Chris was a victim. Even how bad I felt, I, I thought, well, God, he, 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 must, he must feel, well, he's, he's ripped my heart out. How was he going to feel? But Colette's sister Jane had information that would rock the family. She came and she started saying that uh, she knew about the affair he'd been having with this other woman. And uh, Colette had asked her not to say anything. It was just horrific, hearing all that. So as well as losing my sister, and like I say, my mum and dad losing their daughter. We have to hear all, all this. <laughs> We'd had information into the uh, investigation team that uh, Christopher Daffin was um, having an affair. And obviously that did become a line of inquiry in its own right. We arrested the other woman. And she'd clarified that there had been a relationship over a number of years, um, that it had been an on-off relationship, um, and that, that it had finished, and that she had no idea whatsoever of his intention to kill Colette. Um, and with her movements uh, and an alibi from other people, we were quite clear that she hadn't been involved in the preparation or the actual act uh, of murder. Christopher Daffin wouldn't admit that he'd been having an affair. He says he was friendly with uh, this woman, but he wouldn't have it that he was having an affair. It's strange, but um, when asked if he was having an affair with this woman, he denied it, but when asked if he'd murdered Colette, he went no comment. Police had arrested Chris less than seven hours after Colette's death. Subsequent searches of Chris's work van had revealed clothes similar to those worn by a man acting suspiciously at the scene, and a logbook belonging to a red-coloured Vauxhall Frontera, the vehicle used in Colette's killing. A vehicle that the police had yet to trace. The frustrations that we're feeling, because this car is still outstanding, you know, we've looked at everything. We've looked at the intelligence systems. We've looked at AMPR, the, you know, the number plate recognition system. We've looked at speed cameras. We've had the helicopter up doing all the surrounding area. We've even gone to the extent of asking the fire service, not just in this county, but other counties, if they get any burnt out vehicles. The car is critical because it's actually the murder weapon that was used to uh, murder Colette. 
and by finding the vehicle hopefully we will then have forensics on the vehicle that would connect Christopher to the inside of the vehicle and collect sadly to the outside of the vehicle. Once again, it was a member of the public that came forward with vital information. A call comes into the police and it's basically a woman local to the community. She's heard about the incident because of how close the community is. And she's walking down a pathway at the back of a club that's waiting to be knocked down. It's totally derelict and stuck right underneath the club in like an open garage is the Vauxhall Frontier. So this is what used to be the uh, Trough League Club. And the day after uh, the murder, this is where the Vauxhall Frontier was found. Detectives found petrol and gas canisters in and around the Frontera. They believe it was Chris Daffin's intention to return to the vehicle at an opportune time and by igniting the canisters, explode both the car and the derelict club, totally destroying any evidence held within it. For us as an investigation team, that would have been quite a critical point for us because a lot of the evidence that we found from the vehicle would have been lost within the fire and obviously buried under, as you can see, quite a large amount of the rubble. DNA and forensic evidence in and around the Frontera undisputedly linked Chris to the vehicle, even down to the shoes he wore on the day of the murder. The decision to make that early arrest was, in my mind, um, you know, validated completely. Because had we not, we would have lost critical evidence. If Christopher Daffin hadn't been locked up on the 8th, we would potentially have lost the evidence in the White Vivaro van, the grey hooded top, the V5 document, and definitely the Frontier vehicle. So, you know, in terms of um, justifying that arrest, uh, and feeling that, you know, it was the right decision to make at that time. You can look back now and think, yeah, it, you know, it was the right decision to make. So the decision then is, is made to charge Christopher in relation to the murder. Police submitted their evidence to the Crown Prosecution Service. And just before 1am on the morning of the 10th of July, 2009, less than 48 hours after Colette Daffin's death, her husband, Christopher Daffin, was charged with her murder. Charges are on the 8th of July 2009 at Chesterfield in County Derbyshire. Murder and collect Daffy and Constant Common. Would you make a little light of that charge? I didn't do it. When I heard about all this, I, I, I thought I, I could read people so well. Uh, I know he wasn't like that initially. He was, he, you know, he was happy, uh, but uh, at least uh, it, it just deteriorated to this stage. Uh, once he's, he, you know, he messed about with other women. There's, there's no, there's probably not, there's no room for three in the marriage. But detectives were about to uncover the real motive behind Colette's murder. The specialist departments that we have that can look deep into people's finances. It was one of the financial investigators, Mark, with just an A4 piece of paper and shaking it with a great smile on his face and puts it on the desk and says, look at that. Well, to me, I basically said, well, what am I looking at? Because it's an insurance policy for £250,000. Life insurance had been taken out on Colette Daffin for a figure far greater than any other previous policy. And police had concerns regarding the authenticity of the signature on the policy. It came back from the forensics at Birmingham, which basically says that that is not Colette's signature. Which again, when you, you sit back and you think, this has obviously been planned over a considerable period of time. Again, that gives you your motive. With overwhelming evidence stacked up against him, Christopher Daffin eventually pleaded guilty to the murder of his wife, Colette. On the 7th of April, 2010, Chris Daffin appeared at Nottingham Crown Court for sentencing. When the judge sentenced Christopher Daffin to 25 years for murder, um, it's, it's, it's a mixed emotion, really. You know that your decisions, your investigations have been sound and that's been justified in a court of law. But you're also conscious you sat in that courtroom and there are numerous...